Dioret Afano, Ayuhu Karaiti, Ko Andrew Dabudeyaho. Today we're looking at the Gospel for Sunday, the 12th of May. It's John chapter 17, verses 6 through to 19. It's part of what's known as Jesus' high priestly prayer. From verse 6. I've made your name known to those whom you have given me in the, from the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As, I've, as you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, so they may be sanctified in truth. It's been quite a number of years since I last read the Lord of the Rings saga, starting with The Hobbit and then through the, through the rest of it. I probably read it over all four or five times. It's a long time back. It starts with an area of Middle Earth called the Shire, which is occupied by a, a people called Hobbits. They are self-satisfied. They're halflings. They're like the size of children. They are still adult, but small. And the thing about them, as I said, they're self-satisfied. They, they do all the normal kind of things that, that people do. And, you know, with their pride and their games that they play. They don't realise, though, that they're being protected. There's a town called Bree where there's a lot of big people live. It's kind of on the edge of the Shire. And it's also protected. Uh, they too are not aware of it, but they're more aware of the lands that are out beyond. Uh, some of the bad and rugged places where all sorts of evil things lurk. There's a group of people known as rangers. When you see them, they look dark and somewhat disheveled. They live in the shadows. And their leader is known simply as Strider because of the way that he walks. He's quiet. He's watchful. And largely mistrusted by people. The rangers are. Yet, what the people don't realise, what the hobbits don't realise, is that their safety in their part of Middle Earth is ensured by the rangers. They keep out those that would do them harm, anonymously, unrecognised, unknown. And Strider is, in fact, Aragorn, son of Arathorn. He's the true and future king of Middle-earth. He's their protector, yet unknown, unrecognised, unloved. 
I want to ask, is it possible that you and I are being protected without realizing it, without knowing it? In Jesus' high priestly prayer, this section that we read for today, he asks, he asks not that we be taken out of the world, but that we be protected, and in particular protected from the evil one. The whole of the statement that we read builds to this request. It's the whole point, this prayer of protection. We find it in verses 11, 12, and especially in verse 15. And it has two parts. First, a recognition and acknowledgement that Jesus has protected his disciples by the use of God's name. But now that he's not going to be around any longer physically, he asks the Father that the Father continues to protect them. And not just him, but all of us. And... Surely, God has, though perhaps not in ways that we might expect. After all, for the twelve, just the twelve, I think eleven of them, eleven out of the twelve, came to pretty grisly ends. Yet it didn't seem to matter. When we look at the Old Testament, where many things go wrong, the Old Testament is a catalogue of disasters. Yet there are points of grace. One of the ones I really like is at the end of the book of Deuteronomy as they're coming into the land where God speaks to the people and says, During the 40 years that I led you through the desert, your clothes did not wear out, nor did the sandals on your feet. And the people would have been thinking, hmm, that's right, we just never noticed. But I think God's intent is, is much deeper. It's much more of a heart thing. And we find it, for me, uh, one of the places I find it perfectly summed up is in Isaiah 30 and 15, where, where, where the Lord says through the prophet, this is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. Hear that again. In repentance and rest is your... In repentance and turning, in turning, in turning toward God and resting in that is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. Moving in, settling down and enjoying the relationship and trusting. But they rejected it. They rejected it. That's what it says. Immediately after the statement, it says, but you'd have none of it. They consistently turned away. See, ultimately, this is about a heart, about a heart given over to God. Jesus talks about, and we've been looking at that over the last couple of weeks, about it in the sense of us abiding in him, that our lives are oriented toward God, that our hearts are turned toward God. Does this mean that things won't go wrong? That disaster will always be avoided? No! Perhaps it does mean, though, that we can face each day with a measure of confidence. The early church, pre-resurrection, after the crucifixion, clearly they were terrified. After the resurrection and before the Holy Spirit, they were still careful, they were cautious. But after Pentecost, we saw a complete switch. And this is where the prayer of Jesus here has been answered. They are empowered. They become known for their joyful boldness. They stared down any challenge. Does this mean they didn't face significant challenges? No, of course not. <laughs> Lots of things happened. Some of them were terrible. But it didn't ultimately seem to matter. Knowing the presence of God in all circumstances was what counted. You just need to look at the life of Paul, the amount of time and places that he spent in prison, the persecutions, the stonings that he suffered, the things that happened to him. Yet it didn't seem to matter as long as his heart and Jesus' heart were aligned. So if you've been aware of being protected, 
The problem is that protection often works simply in the background, a wee bit like our um, antivirus software on our computers, and we don't often notice it. It just works in the background. We're more likely to notice it when it isn't there. Perhaps when we wander away, when we disengage from Jesus and we start to notice things sneaking back into our lives that haven't been there perhaps for a long time. See, it's not so much about our outer circumstances. It's about our inner security and a sense of belonging and being held. The truth is that bad things still happen to good people. And so often all I can do is put it into the area of mystery. There are those for whom everything seems to go wrong. Yet I've got a deep conviction that God is able to redeem anything and everything. From where I am at the moment, I have a profound gratitude for a privileged life. Did my life turn out as I expected? No, but then I never really expected much. As I sit looking out over our back garden, I have a profound sense of gratitude. I think, how did this happen? There were times when over the more recent years, I started to get a little bit concerned about my looming retirement and how this was going to work out. I imagined that I would be ending my days in a council flat and eventually get carted out in a pine box and that would have been okay. And it could still happen. And yet as I would pray, I would always have this kind of responsive sense of the Lord saying, just trust me, just trust me. It's going to be okay. So here, as I say, it could still happen. I could still end up in a, we could still end up in a council flat. It's not looking likely. Yet for now, I count myself deeply privileged. I look out and I just have to pinch myself. Is it because I'm good? No. But it's true that I've become more aware of the protection of the spirit. I'm one who has long been wracked by fears and insecurities. I'm a specialist in anxiety. It always is a wonder to me for people who have no idea what anxiety is like. For years I struggled with agoraphobia. And yet, as this relationship with Jesus has grown, this is not just about knowing about, and it's not just about knowing scripture, it's about a kind of sense of connected relationship as I've become more aware of profoundly, profoundly loved I am by God. All that stuff has just seeped away, for now anyway. I'm privileged and feel protected by God's Spirit. I hope it's true for you too. And if it's not yet, I know that it can be. That the prayer of Jesus still is to be answered in all of us. God bless you. Amen.